I wish to welcome you to this lecture series on head and neck anatomy, where we'll be looking at largely topographic anatomy of the structures within the head and neck region. This will be a series of lectures. And in this particular first lecture, we are going to focus primarily on the topographic anatomy of the human skull. We'll also look at the scalp and the face as well. Um, specific things that you're going to learn are the following. So we'll take some time to look at the external anatomy of the skull. We'll also look at the anatomy of the cranial cavity. After that, we will have a mention of the various foramina of the skull and what they contain. Then we'll take some time to focus on the scalp itself, where our main intention is to look at the definition, what this scalp. We're also going to look at the layers of the scalp and the neurovascular supply of the scalp. We will also tailor that with its clinical importance. And lastly, we look at the bones, soft tissues, and neurovascular structures in the face. We'll also, of course, define where that face is. So let's begin with the first large agenda, which is to look at the anatomy of the skull itself. We know that the skull is the bony skeleton of the head region, and it is actually the most complex osseous structure in the body. In a child or a newborn, if you are to pinpoint the separate osseous elements or the ones that will ever become born eventually, we can count approximately 28 separate bones of the human skull. That's quite huge compared to the actual size of the skull. Before we go much into the details of its anatomy, perhaps it's important to just underscore the key functions of the skull. We know that it houses a number of structures. In particular, this is where the brain is contained, this is where the brain is protected. Other than protecting the brain, we know that special sense organs are also housed in the skull. Think about the tongue, the eye, the nasal epithelium that is for responsible for olfaction. Think about the ear. So they are housed within the skull. Now, the parts of the upper airways, like now the nasal cavity itself and the pharynx are also found within the skull or partly housed within the skull. And then we also talk about the proximal part of the GIT. And in particular, we're thinking about, again, the oral cavity and parts of the pharynx, which are also housed within the skull. So the, the skull houses a number of structures. Apart from that, the skull forms a point of muscular attachment. There are many muscles that attach to the skull and also to the rest of the body. For example, the muscles that attach the skull to the cervical spine or to the clavicle and the like, to the scapula and the like. So it's for muscular attachment. And those muscles help, therefore, to somehow move the skull in different directions. It is also important to note that the skull provides a mechanism where the mandible can actually move. The mandible is the lower jaw, and we know that the mandible moves for a number of purposes. Of course, top on the list is for mastication but also for just talking. We need the mandibular movement for speech and for mastication. So because of that, the skull is important, therefore, in mastication and also in speech. Occasionally, we use the term cranium when you're referring to the skull. Now, the distinction here is that the cranium is the skull when the mandible is not there. So I know that sometimes we can interchange them, but just understand uh, in strict meaning, 
the skull is the whole thing and cranium is the skull without the mandible. Let's narrow down that skull shortly, or sorry, to the, mand to the cranium shortly. We divide the cranium into two parts, or we can say that it has two parts. This is what we call the neurocranium and the viscerocranium. Let's start the neurocranium. What is neurocranium? Neurocranium refers to the bones of the skull that house the brain. Of course, because they house the brain and the brain is covered by cranial meninges, it means that neurocranium also houses the cranial meninges. Even cerebrospinal fluid, which is found within the brain is also, or around the brain is also enclosed by the neurocranium. We can further divide that neurocranium, which is this region. We can further divide the neurocranium into two. This top part of the neurocranium is what we call the calvaria. So the calvaria is the top of the neurocranium. These bones, which are on the top of the neurocranium, tend to be flat. The reason why they are flat is because partly because of how they are developed. Usually they develop from intermembranous ossification. And when we say that bones develop from intermembranous ossification, it means that first there's a connective tissue membrane that is laid down, and then that connective tissue membrane transforms into an osseous element. So that when these bones are forming first, there's a membrane template, there's a fibrous membrane as a template before that membrane ossifies to become bone. And so the flat bones of the skull and especially of the calvaria form through intermembranous ossification. Because of that, we can call the top part of the skull the membranous neurocranium. One of the unique things about the bones of the membranous neurocranium is that in adults, and this is a bit different from uh, in the neonatal period and the fetal period, in adults, each bone consists of two cortical tables, or let me say compact zones of bony table or bony plate and a central trabecular bone. Maybe this will illustrate that better. So there's a cross section through one of the bones of the neurocranium on the top there. So there's a hard or compact or cortical bone on the inside there, that's one table. And there's another thin table on the outer zone. And in between is the trabecular bone or what you call cancellous bone. So the understanding is this, that there are two cortical plates of bone tissue, and at the center of it, we have trabecular bone. That trabecular bone contains bone marrow, and that trabecular bone is what you call a deep low. So radiologically, this will appear very unique. It will appear like this one. You have um, two cortical plates, the outer cortical plate and the inner cortical plate, as you can see there, and the central zone which now contain marrow tissue. That darker zone is the deep low. And then this brighter zones are what we call hyperdense zones, the outer table and the inner table. Perhaps I can play this so that you see uh, that concept, what I'm talking about. So it's scanning through, this an axial cut through the neurocranium so here we are now at the top of the skull. You can see some sutures there. We'll talk about them shortly. But as you can see, there is a deep flow. There's a deep flow there between or sandwiched between two cortical plates. So that cut has gone from the calvaria now. We are now at the level of the orbit. So we're still seeing calvario bones on this end though. Right, so that is the Calvaria.
Now, the bones that form the calvaria are many. And uh, it would be nice, therefore, to take some time with an atlas to just try to highlight some of these bones. You'll talk about the parato bones. You'll talk about the squamous part of occipital bone. You'll talk about the squamous part of the temporal bone. Talk about the squamous part of the frontal bone. And you'll talk about the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Very important to note. So in this particular image, we see that the parietal bone, that the squamous part of the frontal bone, this is the squamous part of the temporal bone, and this is the squamous part of the occipital bone, this is the greater wing of the sphenoid. So those are the bones which form the membranous neurocranium, the calvaria of the skull, the top part. Now, the second part of the neurocranium is the skull base, which is largely this lower zone of the neurocranium, this lower zone, that is what we call the skull base. The bones of the skull base tend to be thick compared to the bones of the membranous neurocranium. And most of these bones form from endochondral ossification. That means that there's a cartilage model that is formed first, and then that cartilage model changes or rather is replaced by bone tissue. And so this is what we call endochondral ossification. For this reason, the bones of the skull base are generally termed as cartilaginous neurocranium. So the skull base is a cartilaginous neurocranium and the calvary is the membranous neurocranium. I want you to have a look at the bones that constitute the cartilaginous neurocranium. Again, there are several bones, but we can highlight a few. You can see the condyles of the occipital bone there. You can see the basilar part of the occipital bone. You can see the petrous part of the occipital bone, the styloid process, sorry, the petrous part of temporal bone, the styloid process of the temporal bone as well, the mastoid processes are part of the temporal bone as well. Going anteriorly, this is the sphenoid and the different parts of the sphenoid, we can see the pterygoid plates, which are part of the sphenoid. This is around the sphenoid body. And uh, this is part of the greater wing of the sphenoid as well. The lesser wing is not visible from below, but you see it from top. There are a number of holes which are present at the skull base. And holes within bone are termed foramina. These foramina allow for move at, uh, passage of neurovascular structure, so arteries, veins and nerves pass through this foramina and I'll be taking us through that shortly. So again, it's important to just have a look at the bones that constitute the skull base. The best thing to do is usually to pick an atlas and just see the different bones. And also when you're in gross anatomy lab, try to then translate what you see in atlas on the actual bone specimen. So that was neurocranium, the bones that house the brain. The second major part of the cranium is what we call the visceral cranium. So what is this visceral cranium? The visceral cranium refers to the bones of the skull that house the face and therefore constituting what we call the facial cranium or the facial cranium. So these are basically the bones of the facial cranium. Now, when you talk about the bones of the facial skeleton, generally, we will talk about this one, zygomatic bone. We'll talk about this one, the maxilla. We'll talk about the nasal bone. Remember, we had said that the mandible is not part of the cranium in quotes. That is true, but it's part of the facial skeleton. 
And so we can still consider it part of the cerebrum, but at least you understand what I mean by that. Um, so when you talk about the bones of the facial skeleton, remember that the mandible, which is the lower jaw, is part of it either way. There are many other bones which are not in this view, uh, like the vomer, the palatine bone, and things like that. They are still part of the facial skeleton. As we can see, the facial skeleton hangs in front of the neurocranium, and therefore it also houses some special sense organs, for example, the nose, the tongue, housed within the facial cranium. Some of the bones of the facial cranium are pneumatized. And what does that mean? It means that they have air cells or air spaces within them. This is particularly true for the bones that are around the nasal cavity. It is for this reason, therefore, that those spaces are termed paranasal sinuses because they're around the nose, they're termed paranasal sinuses. So paranasal sinuses refer to air-filled spaces within the bones that surround the nose. This image shows you the facial cranium still, that's the lower jaw, that's the maxilla, this is the zygomatic bone, the nasal bone is there. We expect the vomer to be somewhere there. And on this lower end, so this is still part of the maxilla, but this one is the palatine bone. That's a palatine bone, which is still part of the facial skeleton. Now this will show us a CT scan image of the head region. It's a coronal view. Uh, emphasize to illustrate bone tissue which appears bright or hyperdense. Uh, the aim of it is to demonstrate to us the different paranasal sinuses. So we'll see them within the bones that surround the nose. These two are the nasal airways. So this is the nasal septum and this is the right nasal airway. This is the left nasal airway. So this is the maxillary teeth. And so that's the region, the palate there, we expect, sorry, the palate in the upper lip there. And that's the apex of the nose. So I want to be focusing around the nasal cavity and the bones. Remember bone is bright and uh, air is dark. So when you see darkness within a bright thing, that is most likely air. It's scanning from the front going backwards. Now we're starting to see the bone that we have in this region. Um, so let me just take it back a bit. So this is the frontal bone. And uh, we can see air within the frontal bone. So the air within the frontal bone there is the frontal air sinus. So that's one of the air sinuses. That's the frontal air sinus. Then moving on, we now see some air within the maxillary bone. That's the maxillary air sinus. This is the maxillary air sinus, a bit prominent. We also see some air within the ethmoidal bone. So these are the ethmoidal sinuses, they're multiple. And uh, so these are still ethmoidal sinuses going posteriorly. And then these are the sphenoidal sinuses. This other one is not a sinus, that's the nasopharynx. Right, so what are we saying in simple terms? There are four paranasal sinuses, the frontal air sinus, the maxillary air sinus, then that's the largest, the maxillary air sinus is the largest. We have the ethmoidal sinuses, which are multiple, then numerous, and then we have the sphenoidal sinuses. There are four paranasal sinuses. As I've already told you, they're named according to the bones that house each of them, and I've given you their names. Great, so, I hope that I've given you a brief summary of the skull anatomy. The best would be to take an atlas, 
and uh, have a look at the bones of the skull. Also, when you go to the pr uh, practical gross anatomy lab, translate what you see in an atlas on the specimen and try to name the different parts of bones. So you may have a view from the front, a view from the side, a view from below. You can also do a view from the top and just name them. I'll not take you through what all those are, but that is a subject matter of you with taking an atlas and a specimen. Okay, that's more practical, better understood that way. Now let's talk about sutures. Sutures are joints which are found between different skull bones. Now remember a sutural joint is basically a fibrous joint where the two osseous elements are joined by fibrous connective tissue, although that fibrous connective tissue is not very thick because when it's very thick like a ligament, then it becomes a syndesmosis. The sutures have minimal fibrous connective tissue joining the two bones. And sometimes that fibrous connective tissue actually disappears completely and the two bones unite in what we call synostosis. Anyway, let's talk about sutures. There are different types of suture morphologies in the skull. And this is largely based or dependent on the amount of strain that a suture usually experience. Now, based on this, there are three types of suture morphologies. This is what we call the serrated morphology, where the sutures, suture line appears to have numerous projections that appear to interlock. As we can see in this image here on the coronal suture, separating the frontal bone and the two parietals. Also, the sagittal suture separating the right and left parietal, and even the lumbar suture there separating the parietal from occipital. So they appear to be having serrated outline uh, where these projections tend to interlock. Then we can also have what we call a simple suture. In a simple suture or what we call a butt end suture, the margins of the adjacent bone are relatively smooth as we can see in this one. This is a suture between the right and left palatal shells of the maxilla. Also the suture between the right and left palatal bone, palatine bone. We can see it's relatively smooth outline. The bones meet end to end. So that's a butt end or a simple suture. Then we can have an overlap of what we call bevel suture. In a bevel type of suture, the adjacent bones appear to overlap. And this is mostly seen in what you call the squamosal suture. This is the suture between the parietal bone and the squamous part of the temporal bone. The two bones appear to overlap. Great, those are the different types of sutures. Again, it is a duty that you need to take up uh, take an atlas and look at the different sutures of the skull and practically also take the skull bone and translate what you see in an atlas on that and try to name the different sutures. It is important that you know the major sutures, uh, the sagittal suture, the lambda suture, the coronal suture, the square muscle suture. Those are the major sutures it's important to know, but as you can see, there are many other sutures beyond even those four that I've mentioned. It's also important to note what we call the different points. So this is the lambda, the junction between lambda suture and sagittal suture is called the lambda. And the junction in sagittal suture and the coronal suture is called the bregma. Now, how will this be different if you're looking at the skull of a neonet or the skull of an infant. There's some unique things about the skull of a neonet or the skull of an infant that are important to highlight. Of course, other than just the overall size, 
let's compare this unique thing. So the skull of an unit and uh, fetus has what you call fontanelles. Fontanelles represent regions where the edges of the bones of the calvaria have not yet fully ossified, especially the corners. And for that reason, they still have some membranous material. Therefore, making the junction that sutures appear wider because they are membranous structures instead of osseous elements at that point. So we have four uh, fontanelles, or you can say there are six, because two are paired and two are not paired. The largest fontanelle is this one, which we call the anterior fontanelle. It is rhomboid in shape, as you can see, or diamond shaped, found at the junction between the sagittal suture, coronal suture, and what we call the metopic suture. So this is the anterior fontanelle, is the largest. This anterior fontanelle is the one that becomes what you call the pregma later in life. It has a number of clinical importance, this anterior fontanelle. Um, it can tell you the degree of intracranial pressure, for example. When the intracranial pressure is elevated, the anterior fontanelle will bulge. And that is what we might see perhaps in meningitis or in a child with hydrocephaly or, or an intracranial growth. When it's sunken, it means there is a decreased intracranial pressure. And that's what we see perhaps in children who are dehydrated. We can also use the anterior fontanelle as an acoustic window to perform cranial ultrasound. We know that we cannot do ultrasound in an adult brain because it's fully covered by bone. But in a neonate, uh, we can do cranial ultrasonography. And usually, anterior fontanelle is an important site. We use it as an acoustic window for that particular purpose. Other than the anterior fontanelle, we also have the posterior fontanelle, which becomes the lambda. We have the anterolateral fontanelle, also known as the sphenoidal fontanelle, which becomes the terion. And the mastoid fontanelle, which is also called posterolateral fontanelle, which becomes the asterion. So the sphenoidal and mastoid fontanelles are paired, so you have right and left while anterior and posterior fontanelles are not paired, so they're just midline. Take your time to check on at what point do these fontanelles close because they close at different timings. I've already told you what they become after they have closed. Other than fontanelles, the fetal skull has wider and even more sutures. Now let's start with the first one, wider sutures. As you can see, this sutural line is quite wide compared to what we saw in the previous images of the adult skull. So the sutural lines are wide, largely because, again, ossification has not reached the age there, so partly still membranous. Now, these wide sutural lines are important, ideally, because they allow some degree of compression degree of uh, collapsibility of the fetal skull or the injury skull, especially during childbirth. So they're very important. It's sort of by mistake that they're wide. The aim is to ensure that during childbirth, when the head of the baby is passing through the birth canal, that it can allow some degree of compression or malleability. Therefore, the head can pass through during childbirth. Very important. So there are wider suture lines. Now, other than being wider, there are extra sutures in the fetal skull than in the adult skull. And importantly, there are two sutures I want to talk about. This is what we call the metopic suture, which is this one. The metopic suture is a suture that exists between the right and the left frontal bone. So we call the metopic suture or the frontal suture. Most of the time to be present and close within the first two years, but it may persist even up to longer than that. So metopic suture is present in the neonatal skull and usually not present in the adult skull. 
Then we also have what we call the symphysis main T. Symphysis main T is the junction. Now it may not exactly be a suture bone. Sorry, it will not be a suture joint, but still a gap. Symphysis main T is a symphysial joint, as the name suggests, which means that that one has some cartilage. Between the right and left mandibular body, at the junction somewhere there, there is usually a joint, what we call symphysis main T. It's a symphysial joint, not a sutural joint, but the understanding here that it's a joint. Um, another unique thing about the neonatal skull is that the calvarial bones tend to be unilaminar as opposed to having the two plates and a diplo. So in simple terms, I'm saying that the neonatal skull does not have the diploic spaces. It is only one uh, laminal bone. It's only one layer of cortical bone. There's no trabecular bone within the calvarial bones of the neonatal skull. Also important to note and perhaps well visualized here that the neonatal skull has prominent frontal and parietal tuberosity. So this is the frontal tuberosity, this is the parietal tuberosity. In particular, the distance between the right and the left parietal tuberosity is the largest transverse distance of the neonatal skull. And that's why most of the time we'll be looking at that distance in a number of things, even determining um, the age of the fetus during obstetric ultrasound, we look at the biparatal diameter. So the parietal tuberosities are very prominent and it provides the largest transverse diameter of the calvaria. These prominence are not quite there much in the adult skull. The neonatal skull also has a relatively large orbits. If you compare that, the size of the orbit, compare that with the whole face, you'll see that orbit appears quite prominent. And perhaps it appears quite prominent because the facial skeleton is relatively contracted or relatively smaller. And that's also another unique thing. Now, what makes the facial skeleton be smaller? It could be a number of things. One of them could just be the fact that uh, the teeth have not yet erupted. And so the jaws, the vertical distances is quite reduced. The sockets where the teeth are attached are called the alveolar processes. They're also absent because the teeth have not yet erupted. So that could be a possibility. The other possibility is the fact that the bones around the face may not necessarily be having the paranasal sinuses yet at this point. As a matter of fact, at the time of birth, the only paranasal sinus that could be present, although very tiny, is the maxillary sinus. The others have not yet fully formed. They are not even visualized. So the paranasal sinus are usually very rudimentary at the time of birth. And so because there are no spaces, so the, the facial skeleton does not quite expand much. Other than those features of the facial skeleton, well, we can also add another reason why the facial visceral cranium appears smaller is the size of the nasal airway, usually a bit smaller at this point. Now, let me give you a few ratios. At the time of birth, if you look at the ratio of the facial cranium to neurocranium, you'll find that the facial cranium is about one to eight. So the facial cranium is really small compared to the expansive neurocranium. And this neurocranium appears uh, disproportionately larger because of the predominant uh, brain development before birth. That before the birth of a child, the brain, this predominant brain development as opposed to predominant facial development. So because of that, the neurocranium will be relatively prominent compared to the visceral cranium. That may have been the same concept uh, I'm bringing. Now, in another skull, 
the facial cranium could be about three to eight, or we can say almost half of the neurocranium. So the neurocranium is still big either way, but for the skull, the facial skeleton is almost half of the neurocranium. The ratio we can give is one to two or three to eight. At the time of birth, one to eight. So you can understand that the ratios have changed significantly. That means that uh, postnatally, the facial cranium grows significantly to catch up. And uh, so there are many reasons how, what contributes the growth as you can work backwards on the reasons I've given previously. Another unique thing about the neonatal skull is that the base of the skull is relatively narrow. It's also very short. If you look at the anterior posterior distance, it's short. Then the transverse distance is short. That means narrow. And the bones there are predominantly cartilaginous because ossification has not yet happened. So the bones there are predominantly cartilaginous, just cartilage. Also important to note that uh, the, the skull has multiple bones that sometimes join. For example, the temporal bone has about six parts. The squamous part of the temporal bone, zygomatic process of the temporal bone, the petrous part of the temporal bone, the mastoid process, the tympanic part, and the styloid process of the temporal bone. All those are part of the temporal bone. In an adult skull, those parts of the temporal bone are well united. However, in the neonatal skull, these parts are not united. So there are multiple parts which are not yet united of a single bone. And temporal bone is a good example of such. Also important to note is that uh, the external acoustic meters, the external acoustic meters is this thing that houses the outer ear. The external acoustic meters of the neonatal skull is short, relatively straight and wholly cartilaginous. That is different from what we have in adults where it's longer, sinusoidal in shape, so it's S-shaped and it has a part that is bony and a part that is cartilaginous. But in neonatal skull, it is wholly cartilaginous. It is more straight and quite short. Also, we can talk about some parts of the neonatal skull that have not fully developed. And in particular, there's what you call the glabella, which is somewhere in front there. The mastoid process, which usually forms somewhere here, part of the temporal bone and the superciliary arches, which are basically somewhere above the eyes there. So these parts are not present in the neonatal skull. They have not yet formed, but in the adult skull, they are formed and they can be seen. Uh, try to understand those concepts, and especially also when you look at uh, the skull of an adult, try to confirm those things which are present, which are not present in the neonatal skull. Now there's some unique mandibular morphology that's also important to note. We can we have already mentioned about the fact that the mandible of a neonate, there are two parts, right and left, separated by the symphysis menti, but that is not in adult. Other than that, we can also look at the mandibular angle itself. This is a mandibular angle. It tends to be more obtuse at the time of birth. And then as somebody grows towards adulthood, it becomes uh, closer to 90 degrees. It may not quite reach 90, but yes, it's closer. So we can say more acute, although in strict sense, it doesn't go less than 90. So it's not actually acute. And then in old age, again, it recedes, it becomes more obtuse. We can also look at the location of the coronoid and the mandibular processes. So usually the coronal process may be slightly lower than the uh, condylar process. Sorry, I said mandibular process should be condylar process. The coronal process usually is slightly lower than the condylar process. And then as the person grows, the coronal process elevates itself quite significantly above the 
condylar process. We can also look at the length, the vertical length of the mandibular body, which changes significantly, largely because of the development of the alveolar processes. Important also to note is orientation of the mental foramen, that the foramen that's actually in front of the mandible there. So at the time of birth, that mental foramen phase is relatively in front, but as people grow, the mental foramen try to face behind or posterior laterally. Try to confirm that again in a gross anatomy specimen when you're in gross anatomy lab. Good, so those are some of the unique things about the neonatal skull. There's some regions, there's some terminology that we use for the neonatal skull that's important to note. So from this point up to the ridges of the eye there, that's generally what you call the face. Then from that region of the eye, ridges of the eye to the anterior fontanelle, that's what we call the brow. That's most likely what will go for forehead in the adult skull. Then from the anterior fontanelle to the posterior fontanelle, this is what we call the vertex. Then from the posterior fontanelle up to somewhere there, this is what we call the occiput. So these are the four major regions of the fetal skull. And we use these terminologies, especially because you want to know which part of the skull is leading the way when a baby is being delivered. Is it a brow presentation? Is it a vertex presentation and the like? So that's why we want to know this part. The vertex presentation is the normal or the best type of presentation. And the reason is because you look at the dimensions that the head provide with different positions of the head. For example, if a baby is coming with this side, the brow, then which dimension is being forced to pass through the birth canal? It is this diameter, quite big mental vertical distance is about 14 centimeter. So for brow presentation, this is what is presented. Very long distance and so very difficult for that baby to be delivered. However, if the head of the baby is fully flexed, the vertex is the one that will be up leading the way. And so this distance is the one that is provided. 9.5 centimeters. This is the suboccipital pragmatic distance that is being provided when the baby is coming with the vertex, the neck fully flexed. This therefore becomes the normal, or the one that is less tedious in terms of vaginal delivery. Because remember, the maternal pelvis, the diameter is about 10 centimeters. So this one can pass through. Well, you can also take time to understand the other dimensions of the fetal skull and try to understand, so with that dimension, which part of the head is leading the way first. I've just picked two, which are on the extreme end so that you see and understand. So that was the external skull, but now let's take some time to look at the cranial cavity. We may not look at cranial cavity in a lot of detail because this is best done when you're looking at neuroanatomy itself. But I'll just say something. So when you cut the skull and remove the calvaria, look at the calvary, you see that it's concave and the calvary will be largely formed by the bones of the calvary itself. But when you look at below, we know that we see some three cavities. These three depressions are the ones we term the cranial fossa. So we have the anterior cranial fossa, middle cranial fossa, and posterior cranial fossa. So those large depressions are present on the cranial cavity. Remember the cranial cavity encloses the brain, the meninges. But in addition to that, it also encloses some intracranial portions of cranial nerves, as well as blood vessels. And blood vessels, they will refer to arteries as well as veins. 
especially the veins are the ones we generally call the dural venous sinuses, and they make some impressions on the skull, as you can see, even in this particular image. Now, a task for you again is for each cranial fossa, it will be important to know which bones are on the floor and which bones are on the edge of each cranial fossa. For example, if you look at the anterior cranial fossa, so we call this on the orbital plates of the frontal bone. We call this one the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. And we call this one the crystal galley of the ethmoid bone. This is the lesser wing of the sphenoid. So we can see that the lesser wing of the sphenoid is on the posterior edge of the anterior cranial fossa. So I'll also want you to do that for uh, at your own time using an atlas. Then when in the lab, you also translate that. That will what will make much sense. You just look at which bones form which cranial fossa. Do that for the anterior cranial fossa, for the middle cranial fossa, which looks like a butterfly here, and the posterior cranial fossa. If you are able to also tell which parts of the brain are housed in which part, it would be good. But that one I can tell you here. So the anterior cranial fossa houses the frontal lobes of the brain, as well as what we call the olfactory bulb, which rests here, and olfactory tracts, which rest there. The middle cranial fossa houses the pituitary gland, which rests there. It also houses the what we call the cavernous sinuses, which rest somewhere there and there. It houses the temporal lobes of the cerebrum, which rest here as well as there. Then it houses cranial nerve from number two to number six. So number two will be passing somewhere there all the way to number six. They'll be housed within the middle cranial fossa. Then we have the posterior cranial fossa, which rests here. This is the posterior cranial fossa housing the pons, which rests somewhere there, medulla oblongata down there. Cerebellum, which rests in this region here. Those three are the ones we call the hindbrain. Other than that, the posterior cranial fossa also houses what you call dural venous sinuses, which are veins veins which drain the brain. So there's a vein that runs here, which you call the transverse sinus. There's a vein that runs there, which you call the sigmoid sinus. There's a vein that runs there, which you call the inferior petrosal sinus. There's a vein that runs there, which you call the superior petrosal sinus. Those ones are housed within the posterior cranial fossa. In addition, the posterior cranial fossa houses cranial nerves number seven, all the way to number 12. There are some arteries which are important to note also where they lie. The brain is supplied by two major arteries. The vertebral basilar artery is usually housed in the posterior cranial fossa. The internal carotid arteries are housed within the middle cranial fossa running somewhere there. Anyway, what would make sense is uh, for you again, take an atlas and a specimen and just look at the bones of the cranial cavity from the cranial fossa point of view and just try to name them. As we finish on the skull, let me mention a few things about the skull. We can use the skull, human skull, for some medical legal purposes. And uh, let me highlight on four occasions where this can happen. One, we can use the human skull in the determination of sex. And this is perhaps uh, where a skull bone has been found and we don't know what this person, male or female. Now, this is usually a bit hard though. There's some decreased level of accuracy, but the point is this, that uh, the skull of males compared to the skull of female, the skulls of female grow and stop growing earlier than the skulls of males. So in terms of growth, the female skull stops growing a bit earlier. And so the manifestations of muscular attachments 
are more pronounced on the male skull than on the skulls of females. With that understanding, there are a lot of prominences that will therefore be used to identify a male skull, while the skull of female will be similar or almost similar to the ones of the pediatric age group. So we use that distinction to pick out the skulls of male, the ones with those prominences, which are largely because of muscular attachments and actions on the skull. Of course, not very accurate, but yes, it can be done. We can also use the skull to determine the chronological age of a person. This is largely based on knowledge of skeletal maturity, which bone ossifies at which age, which joints unite at which age and things like that. And because you say that there are several bones in the skull, we can actually use this with a lot of great accuracy in the juvenile skull rather than in the adult skull. Because in the adult skull, everything has already grown. But in the juvenile skull, some are still growing, some have already fused, some are not yet. So we can use, we can map out that radiologically and tell the approximate age of a skull in the pediatric age group. Skull can also be used to determine racial origin. This is not accurate at all, largely because there's a lot of overlap that exists between the different characteristics of the racial spectrum. And even within one particular racial race, there's a large spectrum of representation. So not very accurate, but yes, there's some people who have tried to map this as Caucasian, Negroid, Mongoloid, and the like. Last but not least, skull can be used for facial approximation. This could be either through computer reconstruction or modeling reconstruction, where perhaps somebody passed on, and it could be a medical legal case again, so people want to know who was this, whose skull was this? Can we be able to tell the person? So this, the skull can be taken and reconstructed, the face reconstructed either using computer uh, method or just putting some model and putting soft tissue on it until an approximate uh, potential face of that particular deceased person is obtained. And then now that can be used to try to present to the public to try to put a name to that kind of a face, if that can work. So these are the medical legal aspects of uh, identification from skull that I wanted to highlight and that summarizes what I want to tell you about the skull. Now, let me take you to the second objective, which is on skull foramina. Again, the best thing would be you taking an atlas and just seeing the different foramen of the skull because they're really many. Most of them are on the skull base, but they're not limited to the skull base, as you can see. I'll just mention the major foramen and perhaps tell you what they contain. So first understand that a foramen is a whole in this context, it's a whole through bone, that's what we call a foramen. The largest foramen is found at the base of the skull there, we call it foramen magnum, the one labeled 10. Foramen magnum is the largest uh, foramen in the base of the skull. This foramen traverses the spinal cord, or you can say brainstem, it's, it's a continuum. Other than that, it also, contain the meninges that are around the spinal cord and brainstem. It also traverses the vertebral arteries as they enter from the neck into the cranial cavity, vertebral arteries. It also traverses the spinal accessory nerve. The spinal accessory nerve usually goes in from C1 to C5 of the spinal cord goes in to join the cranial accessory nerve to form the accessory nerve itself. We also have cervical meningeal nerves. These are cervical nerves which enter through the foramen magnum to supply the meninges within the posterior cranial fossa. Of course, CSF will also be around the spinal cord, and so it also passes through the foramen magnum. CSF is cerebrospinal fluid. <clears throat> 
We have what you call the carotid canal, level 21 in this particular image, that the carotid canal. So usually it's called a can canal rather than using the term foramen because it has some wall. It's, a, it's more of a tunnel within the petrous bone. Carotid canal is the one that traverses the internal carotid arteries, which also supply the brain. And there's usually enough plexus around the internal carotid artery, which are sympathetic in function. We call that one the internal carotid nerve plexus. There are sympathetic nerve plexus around the internal carotid artery. So those are the two contents of the carotid canal. We have the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone labeled one there. This represents tiny holes through that thin bone of the ethmoid bone. Cribriform means sieve-like. It means it has some tiny holes through it. For the passage of the olfactory nervelets, which represent the first cranial nerve. Optic canal is the one labeled for here. So optic canal is for passage of two major things. The second cranial nerve, which you call the optic nerve going to the eye, and the ophthalmic artery, which also supplies the eye, among other structures within the orbit. So in this image, this is the orbit. We can see some three foramina at the apex of the orbit there. This is the medial side, this is the lateral side, so this is top bottom. So this is the optic canal for the passage of the second cranial nerve, optic nerve, as well as the ophthalmic artery. The other one is what we call the superior orbital fissure. And then we have the inferior orbital fissure here. This is the superior orbital fissure. The purpose of the superior orbital fissure is that uh, it is for the passage of the following. So the third cranial nerve, oculomotor nerve. Fourth cranial nerve called trochlear nerve. The first division of the fifth cranial nerve, which you call the ophthalmic nerve. So understand the fifth cranial nerve is called trigeminal nerve. It has three divisions, ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. The first division is what you're calling ophthalmic, and that's the one that passes through the superior of fission. Then we have the sixth cranial nerve, which you call the abducens nerve. So those nerves, number three, four, first division of five, and number six, pass through the superior bit of fissure. In addition to that, we also have the ophthalmic vein passing through the superior bit of fissure. Then the inferior bit of fissure is here for the passage of the maxillary nerve. Maxillary nerve is the second division of the trigeminal nerve, maxillary nerve. In addition to that, we also have the infraorbital, the inferior orbital artery also passing through there. The inferior orbital artery passes through there. Now, when we trace the inferior orbital fissure posteriorly, it will lead us to a small opening somewhere there, which is best seen from the cranial cavity rather than from this side. But that small opening is what you call the foramen rotundum. That is the exit foramen from the cranial cavity that the maxillary nerve uses. So from the cranial cavity, it passes through the foramen rotundum, which means round foramen, then pass through the inferior orbital fissure. Foramen rotundum for passage of maxillary artery. So this is the foramen rotundum. Sorry, so this one here is the foramen rotundum, that one, the one labeled five, that's the foramen rotundum for the passage of the maxillary nerve. So it passed through here first, then appeared in the inferior bit of fissure. Remember number 14, 
is the superior orbital fissure. Then you have foramen ovale label six here. It means the oval foramen. So this foramen ovale or this ones, this is a foramen ovale. Foramen ovale is for the passage of the third division of the trigeminal nerve, which we call the mandibular nerve. It is also for the passage of what we call accessory meningeal artery. This is another structure called the lesser petrosal nerve that passes through here. And uh, usually there's an emissary vein that also goes through foramen ovale. An emissary vein represents the veins which connect extracranial with intracranial veins. We commonly remember the contents of foramen ovale as MEL, M-A-L-E. Mandibular nerve, accessory meningeal artery, lesser petrosal nerve, and emissary vein, MEL. That lesser petrosal nerve is a branch of the ninth cranial nerve, which we call glossopharyngeal nerve. Now we have the internal auditory meters. The internal auditory meters is label number 13 here. The internal auditory meters is for the passage of the seventh and the eighth cranial nerves. Seventh cranial nerve is called facial nerve, and the eighth cranial nerve is called the vestibular cochlear nerve. So in particular, the vestibular cochlear nerve goes to the ear and it ends there, but the facial nerve goes to the ear and passes out from the ear outside. So the facial nerve comes out and we'll talk more about the facial nerve in our next session where we're going to look at uh, parotid region and facial nerve anatomy. Then we have the jugular foramen. Jugular foramen is labeled 12 here. So the passage of the ninth cranial nerve called glossopharyngeal, 10th cranial nerve called vagus, 11th cranial nerve called accessory nerve. In addition, there's a vein that passes through there, which we call the internal jugular vein, perhaps the largest structure there, internal jugular vein. Last but not least, we have the hypoglossal canal, which is labeled 11 in this particular image. The hypoglossal canal is for the passage of the 12th cranial nerve, which we call the hypoglossal nerve. So, all right, so these are the major foramina of the skull and the structures which pass through them. Now, I want to demonstrate to you perhaps what you are likely to come across in clinical practice, the kind of skull anatomy that you are unlikely, you are likely to encounter in your clinical practice. Because remember, it should be more about looking at patients and the investigation that patients have presented with. So the first image there will be capturing for us the anatomy of the skull from the top, and this second one be anatomy of the skull from more of the lower part of the skull. So this will be more of calvarius side, and this is more of the skull base. I am not intending to tell you what is what, but it will be scanning through, and there's some numbers there which are labeled. Maybe you try to know or pinpoint which structure is which one. The idea here is just to tell you that there quite extensive anatomy of the human skull that you need to just take time to go through slowly. So that one is scanning. And remember, each number there represents something, ideally. It may be the name of a bone. It may be the name of a suture. It may be the name of an impression that some vascular structure makes on the bone. Whichever thing it is, there are a number of parts. So that has captured for us largely the vertical side of the skull, the top part of the skull. Now let's try this other one, which has even more labels. Um, disclaimer, this one captures even what we've not talked about on the 
lower part of the skull, but it's okay for still knowledge purposes. It's just good to have an idea. It was, this one also captures for us several foramina, as you may have seen by now. It was also capturing for us a number of uh, sinuses as well, as you may have seen by now. So it's, it's now almost in the middle of the skull. Now it's going towards the vertex, as we can see, and we'll end it there, in the middle there. Okay, so the idea is you can play this slowly at your own time and try to give names to each of those structures labeled. Great, now we can go to the third agenda focusing on the skull panatomy. Maybe start by defining what is the skull. The skull prefers the soft tissues that cover the calvaria. In this particular image, you can see that blue outline is the region we are calling the scalp, that soft tissue covering over the calvaria. By now, you know what calvaria is. So what are the extents of the scalp? The scalp extends anteriorly to the forehead, posteriorly to the superior nuclei. And superior nuclei is a ridge somewhere on the occipital bone there. And laterally, at the level of the ear, especially we're talking about the external acoustic meters to be somewhere there, and the zygomatic process or arc, which is somewhere there. This red one, red outline is a temporal region, a subject matter of another talk, not today. Now let's look at the layers of the scalp. The scalp is described to have about five layers, and let's go through these layers slowly. The first layer is what we call the skin, basically that the skin. Now, what's unique about the skin of the scalp? We know that the skin of the scalp is hairy. So it has a lot of hair follicles. The relatively thick skin with uh, a lot of hair follicles. And because it has a lot of hair follicles, it also therefore has a lot of sebaceous glands. It is for that reason that the skin of the scalp, therefore, is the commonest site of occurrence of what you call sebaceous cysts. These are cysts which um, form from sebaceous glands. So there's some diseases that will particularly affect the skull predominantly because they target the sebaceous glands. Be beneath the skin is the subcutaneous tissue. That subcutaneous tissue beneath the skin is relatively dense connective tissue. So that subcutaneous tissue is dense connective tissue. It's a fibroadipose, but dense connective tissue. <clears throat> now, what's unique about this dense connective tissue? This dense connective tissue has the neurovasculature, the nerves, the arteries, the veins run through this particular layer. So it's richly vascularized. And it's important to note also that the wall of the blood vessels, especially the walls of the arteries, are firmly adherent to this particular layer, to the level that if there's a cut, there's an injury within this particular layer, the lumen of the blood vessels don't easily close because they are firmly adherent to the vessels and so the, this layer holds the walls of the vessels apart so that the vessels tend to remain patent and so bleeding becomes a lot from the scalp, even from a very small cut. Deep to this dense connective tissue layer is a layer of muscle. There's a flat muscle within the scalp which you call epicranius. This epicranius muscle has two parts. There's a part in front, which you call frontalis. There's a part behind, which you call occipitalis. So we can call it occipitofrontalis muscle. 
Now, those are the two bellies of it. In the middle, the two muscular bellies are connected by an aponeurosis. That aponeurosis, what we call the galea aponeurotica. And so basically, we find the occipitalis muscle and its aponeurosis on layer three of the scalp. Beyond that, there's a loose connective tissue zone. This loose connective tissue zone can be termed as the subaponeurotic layer or the subgallial plane. This loose connective tissue zone provides mobility for the scalp so that the scalp, the other three layers can move freely on this layer. This is a potential space for accumulation of uh, substances, fluid, for example, blood can accumulate within this region. Also, we can use this region to peel off the skull. For example, if you need a flap, it can be easily lifted from this layer. It provides a surgical plane that is the subaponeurotic layer, which is somewhere there. And lastly, we have the pericranium. The pericranium is the outer periosteum of the skull, the outer periosteum of the skull. Remember the inner periosteum is also called the endosteum. Now the outer periosteum is basically the periosteum or the pericranium. That pericranium is firmly adherent to the skull and if it's cut, it retracts. It's very, very difficult to return it back if it's injured. Now, I have shared some letters there to help you give you a mnemonic that you can use to remember the layers of the skull. So this S there, C-A-L-P, and you can read that one again as scalp. So this skin, connect tissue, remember it's dense, aponeurosis of occipital frontalis and its muscle, loose connected tissue, which is subaponeurotic and periosteum or pericranium. These are the layers of the skull. Now let's talk about arterial blood supply to the scalp. The scalp enjoys a rich source of blood supply. The blood vessels which go to the scalp is an anastomosis between the branches of external carotid artery and the branches of internal carotid artery. In particular, the branches of internal carotid artery give us two arteries through the ophthalmic artery. We have the supratrochlear and supraorbital artery, which are these two. These are viewed from the top. Supratrochlear is medial and supraorbital is lateral. So these ones come from the upper side. From the orbit, they move, they supply the forehead. Then from the external carotid artery, we have a number of arteries. In particular, we have the superficial temporal artery, which is on the side with its posterior branch and an arterial branch there. Anterior branch is also called the frontal and the posterior branch is called the parietal branch. So this is the superficial temporal artery on the side. Then you have the posterior auricular artery, which runs somewhere there behind the ear and the occipital artery quite behind there. So occipital, posterior auricular, and superficial temporal are branches of external carotid, while supratrochlear and supraorbital are eventually branches of the internal carotid. These arteries form a rich anastomosis within the dense connective tissue layer of the scalp. Because of that rich anastomosis, the scalp is richly vascularized and for that reason, if you have a cut on the scalp, it will bleed profusely as well. So I've already told you why scalp wounds bleed profusely, and I've given you two reasons so far. One, rich anastomosis. So there are a lot of collaterals. But two, the vessels remain patent because of the pool of the dense connective tissue layer 
So again, that will contribute to bleeding profusely. Also note that if it is richly vascularized, then it means that healing is also faster. So in as much as they bleed fast, scalp wounds also heal faster. They heal very fast. Okay, because of the connection between the intracranial and the extracranial arteries, uh, there could be also spread of uh, infections, but that will largely apply to venous drainage rather than arterial supply. So let's hold that concept and discuss it under veins. How about the sensory innovation of the scalp? Remember sensory here? refers to innovation to the skin or basically the subcutaneous structures here. So the forehead here, that region, the territory of the ophthalmic division. So there are a number of nerves which eventually come from the ophthalmic nerve that apply this region. We still have the supratrochlear, suprobital nerve in that particular region. And then this territory will be the territory of the maxillary nerve. And we have some branches like the zygomatic or temporal nerves eventually from maxillary division. This region, the territory of the mandibular division or trigeminal. In particular, we have the auricular temporal nerve there, which is from the mandibular division or trigeminal. So you notice that the anterior part of the scalp will receive innervation from the fifth cranial nerve. V1, V2, V3. V1 is ophthalmic, V2 is maxillary, V3 is mandibular division. Then the posterior aspect of the scalp will receive innervation from the nerves, from cervical nerves. So in this zone, we'll have the great occipital nerve, in that zone, third occipital nerve. And in this zone, we have the lesser occipital and the greater auricular nerves. So the greater and the lesser occipital nerves are from the cervical plexus. Uh, these are usually ventoremi, but these are the ones, the third and the greater occipital are those remi nerves. This map shows us exactly what I've just said. So remember posteriorly, cervical nerves, dorsoremi or ventoremi, and anteriorly of uh, the trigeminal nerve through the three divisions. That is sensory supply. Let's talk about some clinical aspects, although I've already mentioned some. Uh, let's just talk about the ones I've not mentioned. If you have a deep transverse cut of the scalp, the wound will get badly. And the question is why? The answer to that question is that if you have a deep transverse cut, it may affect the aponeurosis. If it reaches the aponeurosis, what happens? Frontalis and occipitalis will contract and the aponeurosis pull apart. And so the wound gaps badly. That could contribute also to profuse bleeding. Uh, the third reason why scalp wounds may bleed profusely. Now, I've already told you some layers of the scalp. Between those layers, you may have accumulation of some fluid substances. Now, caput succeed them is usually the one that we see during childbirth when the head of the baby and especially the presenting part is, is limited within the birth canal. They could have some edema because of reduced venous return. And so that edema that appears on the center of the presenting part is what we call the caput succedinum. Uh, you may also have accumulation of fluid below the galea. And that's what you call subgalel hemorrhage. So that is usually within the surgical plane of the scalp, which is the loose areolar tissue or the loose connective tissue layer that the site of accumulation of hemorrhages sometimes when you have bleedings accumulated there. Well, there are other types of accumulation that you may also have. Uh, 
you, as you can see there. Let's now focus on the last agenda of uh, today's topic. So this will be the last agenda that we're doing on this lecture. And the agenda is to basically look at the bones of tissues and neurovascular supply of the face. We've talked much about the bones actually, so we'll focus more on the neurovascular, sorry, the soft tissues and neurovascular structures of the face. Let's begin with some landmarks on the face. Uh, this may not be the normal or the usual things that we know, and so you might be wondering. But usually there are a number of regions that you, the structure that you can pick from the face. Remember the face begins from the hairline there. And of course this region in front of the ear. So that's what you call the face. So this is what you call the root of the nose there, the tip of the nose. This separation between the right and left nostril of the nariz is what we call the columella, and the groove there is what we call the philtrum. The vermilion is the border between the normal skin there and that part of the lip. That's what we call the vermilion border. Uh, the labiomental groove is that depression in the lower lip there. It's also important to familiarize the parts of the ear. This is the helix, and the following is the anti-helix. Then you also have the tragus, the anti-tragus, and that that point there is the anti-tragic notch. This is the ear lobule, the part that doesn't have the cartilage. Uh, similar concepts that we can see on this zone, but uh, take note of the nasolobial fold, which is that region there. Right, so it's good to familiarize with the face and especially the surface anatomy of the face. I've tried to highlight for you a number of concepts there. Let's talk about the superficial layers of the face. The face can be described to have some five superficial layers. The first layer is the skin, which consists of the epidermis and the dermis, just like any other part of the body. The second layer is what we call the subcutaneous fibroadipose tissue. We'll talk about it shortly. The third layer is what we call the esmas, standing for superficial muscular aponeurotic system. It's a layer of its own. Then we have the layer of retained ligament and space. And lastly, we have the parotid masseteric fascia. These are the five layers of the superficial face. We can talk about the subcutaneous fibroadipose tissue because I've already told you the skin is similar. The skin of the face and the one of the rest of the body, the same thing, epidermis and dermis. How about the subcutaneous fibroadipose tissue? The subcutaneous fibroadipose tissue is a layer that is present in the whole face. All parts of the face have this layer. This layer have variable degree of adiposity. So there's some regions with a lot of adipose and there's some regions which are very minimal adipose. Some regions have fibrous tissue predominant and some regions have minim minimal fibrous tissue. This is the subcutaneous fibroadipose tissue. The adiposity varies with regions, as I've mentioned, but also varies with the age of an individual. And especially the older people will have less of the adiposity. So we can see that here, this is the subcutaneous fibroadipose tissue layer of the skin, which is the second layer of the superficial face. This adipose is especially more prominent around the regions of the cheek, and now they contribute to the mass of the chicks. Beyond that, we have the third layer, which we call the ESMAS, standing for superficial muscular aponeurotic system. The ESMAS layer is a single extensive layer with variable composition of either muscle tissue 
or fibrous tissue or aponeuretic tissue. So usually variable. So some regions may have muscle, some regions have aponeurotic tissue, basically. It's a variable layer. The layer is generally suspended, which means not attached to bone directly. It hangs freely with a suspended layer. No direct contact with bone, especially. And in this region, we can see this is the layer of uh, esmus, this one here, beneath the subcutaneous tissue, and you can see the suspension there. So some regions have aponeurosis, some regions have muscle. The muscles which are contained within this layer, some of these muscles are actually termed the muscles of facial expression. Now, not all the muscles of facial expression are in this layer, not take note of that one, but some muscles of facial expression are actually lying in this particular plane. Muscles of facial expression are many, we are going to talk about them shortly. Then we have the layer of retained ligament and space. The layer of retained ligament and space refers to, let me talk about the retained ligaments. Retained ligaments are basically fascial bands that are present at specific sites on the face. And these fascial bands serve to anchor the skin of the face to the underlying bone. As you can see this one, these fascial bands, they anchor the skin of the face to the underlying bone. These fascial bands help to then prevent extreme sagging of the facial skin, especially with old age. Uh, there are different points where we'll have the ligaments, basically. So like the masseteric ligaments are present, they are well known. The mandibular ligament is there, well known. The gomatic ligament, well known there. Beneath the esmus layer, where the retained ligaments are traversing, there are some regions that will have a potential space. So this potential space is not present in all the regions. And in particular, it's absent on the region around the parotid. So on the parotid, the esmus is adherent to the parotid gland and fascia. But uh, coming anteriorly, there's a potential space there. And that's the space we are referring to. Last but not least, the parotid masseteric fascia refers to basically a thin or a filmly fascia that is on the parotid gland and also covers the duct of the parotid gland as well as the masseter and the buccal pad of fat. It's a very thin uh, film areola tissue layer. It's not a very thick, dense connective tissue as we'd expect the fascia to be. But anyway, perhaps that's what we can consider as the deep fascia of the face. In essence, we don't consider the face to be having deep fascia. And that is why muscles of facial expression will attach directly to skin in some regions. Lower down, so you can see that filmy thing. Lower down, this fascia is continuous. The investing fascia of the neck, the investing fascia of the neck is termed the deep fascia of the neck. Okay, now sensory innervation of the face. Similar concept like what we described for the scalp. So this, the anterior region is branches of the, of the trigeminal nerve and posterior regions, largely cervical nerves. So for the territory of the trigeminal, there'll be territory of, of thalamic, territory of maxillary, and territory of mandibular. Now, because I'm talking about face, now we talk about specific nerves. So branches of ophthalmic nerve in the face around this region, you can see the infratrochlear nerve there. Branches of uh, maxillary nerve, the largest is the inferior orbital nerve there. Branches of mandibular nerve around this region, the largest, the mental nerve there. But you, of course, you have other nerves as well, as you can see in this particular image. For the posterior side, nothing changes much. 
Um, we have the dorsoremi behind. That's not particularly face, but at least we have the ventoremi of cervical plexus here that will contribute partly to the innervation of the face. Remember that one is sensory, not motor. Now let's talk about musculature of the face. The muscles of the face are of two categories. You have muscles of facial expression and you have muscles of mastication. Let's begin with the muscles of facial expression. They have some general characteristics. Muscles of facial expression have some extensions that attach directly to skin. This is because the face doesn't have the, diff the actual deep fascia. So they are direct extensions to skin, very unique for muscles of facial expression. We don't expect muscles to be attaching to skin, but muscles of facial expression have direct insertion to the skin. And that is why they are able to move the skin. Perhaps that's why they are considered to be of facial expression. Although that's not really their primary role, it is believed that their primary role is that they act as sphincters and dilators around the facial orifices, the eyes, the mouth, and the like. They act as sphincters and dilators so that their facial expression is a secondary adapted function as part of human communication. Another third characteristic is that uh, these muscles are derived from the mesenchyme of the second pharyngeal arc. And because of that embryonic origin, muscles of facial expression are innervated by the seventh cranial nerve, what you call the facial nerve. And so the facial nerve provides the motor innervation to muscles of facial expression. Remember those four characteristics. Now, there are many muscles of facial expression, but we can categorize them into groups. There's the epicranial group, which consists of occipitalis, frontalis, and temporoparietalis. We have the ones around the orbits and the palpebra, and there are many, obicularis oculi, corrugator supercilii, labeta palpebris superioris. We have the muscles around the nose, so procerus, nasalis, and depressor septi. And the ones around the oral cavity are even many. The bucolabial group of muscles are several. Some of them act as elevators, some as depressors, some as retractors, some as evators, some as sphincters of the mouth. What I want you to do, this is not the kind of anatomy that you'd want even to see in a gross anatomy lab per se, but more of opening an atlas and appreciating the muscles. So at your own time, look at which ones are around where and how can you classify them, which ones are the epicranial group, which ones are the sacamobital group, and things like that. So this one, you pick an atlas, not really gross anatomy lab. If you try that, you are not going to see even 40% of them and you'll be frustrated. Now let's talk about muscles of mastication. The muscles of mastication insert onto and therefore move the lower jaw. So these ones move the mandible. These muscles are derived from the first pharyngeal arc as opposed to the second. They are derived from the first pharyngeal arc. And having said so, these muscles are innervated by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. So they come from the first pharyngeal arc and they're innervated by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. The muscles are largely Four, but two are the ones on the face, masseter and temporalis. So this is the masseter muscle, and this is temporalis muscle. Those are the ones on the face. But there are others which are found within a region called the infratemporal fossa. We have the lateral pterygoid muscle and the middle pterygoid muscle. We'll talk more about them later. And there are others like the digastric muscle and the myelohyde muscle. So the digastric and the myelohydal are somewhere in the neck. We call them suprahyoid muscles we'll have a talk on muscles of mastication under a different topic under this head and neck series. So not the subject matter of today's talk, but you'll remember that uh, the nerve supply is mandibular division or trigeminal and not facial. Let's talk about the arterial blood supply to the face. So the face receives a rich source of arterial blood supply, quite extensive. We have branches of the facial artery. We have branches of the superficial temporal artery. We have branches of the maxillary artery. 
and we have branches of the internal, sorry, of, of the ophthalmic artery, which is basically eventually internal carotid artery. So the internal carotid artery will give you branches supratrochlear and suprabital, as we'd mentioned earlier. The purpose of this slide is to try to illustrate to you the extensive branching of the facial artery. There are several branches of the facial artery that go to the face. Again, the purpose is of this illustration is to demonstrate to you that facial artery has several branches. And so at your own time, take an atlas and see the various branches of the facial artery to the face, what do we call them? Note that the terminal branch is called the angular artery there. Of importance to note is that uh, the facial artery has a tortuous course. It means very wavy. And the purpose of this is to allow for the mobility of the head on the neck so that when you turn, when you rotate the head, the artery is not necessarily stretched. So the tortuous course allows for head mobility on the neck. Your duty will be to look at the various branches of the facial artery on the face various branches of the maxillary artery on the face, various branches of superficial temporal artery on the face, and various branches of the internal carotid on the face. Very rich source of blood supply. Venous drainage is also important to note, and I'll combine venous drainage of the scalp and face together. So facial vein is formed from the angular vein there, going all the way, facial vein drains all the way. Usually at the lower end somewhere, the facial vein will be joined by this vein here that you see, and uh, we'll call it the common facial vein that eventually drain into the internal jugular vein. Sometimes facial vein will be joined by the lingual vein and then eventually drain into the internal jugular vein. So point to note is that facial vein drains into the internal jugular vein eventually. We have superficial temporal vein which joins with the maxillary vein to form the retromandibular vein. Retromandibular vein has two divisions, posterior division and anterior division. The anterior division joins facial vein, and that goes to the internal jugular vein as common facial vein. The posterior division of retromandibular vein joins the posterior auricular vein to form the external jugular vein, which is considered the only tributary of the subclavian vein. Occipital veins from behind usually go to suboccipital venous plexus, which then connect to different parts, deep veins in the neck. So again, understand this territorial drain of the face, anteriorly, facial vein, somewhere in there, superficial temporal, posterior auricular, and occipital vein, and how they drain eventually. There's what we call the pterygoid venous plexus. The pterygoid venous plexus is located within the infratemporal fossa. We'll talk more about it at that time. But important to note that this pterygoid venous plexus has several connections. And in particular, there's a deep facial vein that connects the facial vein to the pterygoid venous plexus, an important route of spread of infection, as we're going to see in this particular slide. So there's what we call the danger area of the face. The danger area of the face, the triangular region, and therefore we can call the danger triangle of the face. The danger triangle of the face is a triangular region where infections from the face can easily spread to intracranial structures. In particular, regions of the face where infections can easily spread to something called the cavernous sinus inside the cranial cavity. So that is why it's called danger, because infections from this triangular region can easily spread to intracranial structures. So going to the cavernous sinus, causing what you call cavernous sinus thrombosis. The boundaries of the tongue is the root of the nose and the angles of the mouth. 
Now, what makes it possible for infections to spread from this region to intracranial structures? There are two routes of spread of infection. Angular vein, which is formed from here, anastomosis with what we call the superior ophthalmic vein. This superior ophthalmic vein passes through the superior mitral fissure and goes to the cavernous sinus. So that's a possible route of spread of infection. But there's also another route. The inferior ophthalmic vein has connections with the pterygoid venous plexus. Also, the deep facial vein has connections with the pterygoid venous plexus. Then pterygoid venous plexus connects to the cavernous sinus through an emissary vein that passes through foramen ovale. So because of that, infections around this region can easily spread to the cavernous sinus, causing cavernous sinus thrombosis. That is why these are danger area of the face. Let's now finish with the lymphatic drain of the face and scalp combined. So we have a number of lymph node groups that drain the face and scalp. Submental lymph nodes drain the lower lip, the tip of the tongue as well in that region. The submandibular group will drain this region from the angle of the mouth to the angle of the eye, this territory, plus the paranasal sinuses. Then from the angle of the eye there to that level, this will be drained by the preauricular nodes as well as the parotid nodes. Behind the ear will be drained by the posterior auricular nodes and uh, extending posteriorly that tail to drain by the occipital nodes. So there are those five lymph node groups that drain the scalp and face. Then eventually all of them drain to deep cervical lymph nodes eventually, as you can see even from this one. We will have another talk on organization of the cervical lymph node anatomy and we'll give a better description of lymph nodes of the neck and their territory. We'll divide them into levels, but in a nutshell, that's what the face and scalp, how the face and scalp are drained. Great, thank you very much. So we will stop there. We've covered quite a lot on the skull, the scalp and the face. Our next series of topic on topographic anatomy head and neck will now be on anatomy of the parotid region. We're going to talk about parotid gland and also a great detail of the facial nerve anatomy. We'll stop there for now. Thank you very much.